icing on Minnewawa, which is one of my favorite lakes in the, in the region here. And the reason why I like it so much is because it's the largest kernel, the longest kernel for sure that I've been honored to harvest here. These sticks right here are made out of uh, cedar. They're the lightest and most durable wood that we have available for uh, making our knockers. And everyone likes them a little bit different. Um, I just made this, this one yesterday. I was teaching a class on how to, teaching the young kids on how to make them. And what you're looking for is nice straight grain, um, seasoned cedar so it's nice and light. These things weigh just a few ounces. And then you wanna shape them to um, fit your hand size. And what you're doing with these is you're picking the rice. So as the rice, as you pass through the rice, you bend the rice gently over and sweep it off from side to side, depending on which way the rice is leaning. Sometimes you can knock both sides, sometimes you can only knock one side. But a good seasoned rice picker takes the kernels off the rice. And it's kind of like blueberry picking, you're only taking that day's rice. But like when my mom would rice, or some other people I rice with, like Louie, them knockers will just twirl, and it's just like a, it's like a rhythm. And they'll just, it, all you hear is this knocker just touching the ripe rice. If you hear, like it's hitting on the stalks, they're not doing it right. You know, it should be just, you're sweeping the tips of the ripe rice off. To give the utmost respect for that rice when you harvest it, just to harvest today's rice when you knock it, just to take the ripe seed. This year was not one of the best years ever, but at least there was some anomen out there. I expected it might even be worse than it was after the big storm we had about a week ago. Manomen the Kay Giza started about a week and a half ago. That's the wild rice moon in the Ojibwe language. And usually it lasts a good month or so, the racing season. This year it only lasted uh, maybe a week or so because of that storm. Now we're at the tail end already because a lot of it fell off the stuff that was ripe. But we did get some manolmen, and this is some of the largest manolmen kernels that I've harvested. I've harvested from many different lakes in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and these kernels here are some of the biggest, but there aren't that many of them this year. But it was nice to get out there and just smell the ripe rice and uh, get enough for a parcher, and at least for ceremonial purposes to get out and harvest. And we come out here to go racing, but it looks pretty thin and far between. You're not going to be able to get all the rice out there like some people will go out there and try to knock all the rice off, but you can't do it like that. When Dave gets me in the race, like this year, I got to reach out and I can pull in the stalks of rice and then strip them kernels so that the rice gets uh, stripped off there instead of whacking it like this here so that that each head breaks about right here with the side that can know. And that's what we don't want. Some people like the athletic people will come out there sometimes and really wail on that race and they'll get the heads. And when you do that, a lot of that race is just hanging there. The ripe stuff is ready to fall off. And if you grab it too quick like that there, it'll fall right back into the water right before you bring it in. You bring it in real gentle like, instead of hitting it down like that there, you strip it like that. It's a real art in harvesting wild rice and you go out there to pick it, you know. Like you keep going out there and you keep getting a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. Pretty soon you got a boat load, you know, and you got a boat load of some good rice. The flavor of the rice varies from lake to lake as well. If the water's clear, it seems like the rice germinates earlier in some lakes. And if it's hard bottom, those are the lakes that we usually go to first to harvest. And then later on, the deeper water lakes will ripen up later in the season. This one we're on here today, it seems to always have rice, even on higher water years. Would have been a decent harvest had the storm wouldn't have hit it right when it did. The, the rice that we harvested today was some of the greener rice that didn't get knocked off from the storm. But we're thankful for what we've been able to harvest. We'll take this rice home with us here today. And if we had too much, we would spread it out on tarps and let it dry slowly in the shade. You don't want it out in the real hot sun. And what you need to do is parch that rice and parch it in that kettle until it's all dry. And then what you do is you take a winnowing basket 
that's a basket made out of birch bark. And when you throw that rice up into the air, you have the wind at your back and that wind will blow the shaft out of the winnowing basket and the heavy rice will fall back in. And then you put that rice away and if you store that rice in a nice dry place, you could keep it for a number of years and it'll stay good. It's super important for us to pass on that resource, that knowledge to the next generation so that they can feed themselves. If you don't pass this tradition on, that it will be lost, you know, and that uh, you don't want to see that be lost. We're at Deadfish Lake, and this is the lowest wild rice lake here on the Fond du Lac Reservation. And this lake was notoriously flooded out whenever we'd have a, a large rain event, especially when the rice is at its critical stage. The floating leaf stage, a lot of times we'll get rain events in June and July that really raise havoc with the wild rice crop. So what we ended up doing was we put a dam, an impoundment, on that west watershed and that way we're able to store that water up in a big rain event and then slowly let it out so that it won't bounce the water level of this lake. The structure behind us is primarily to control the level of Stony Brook. We don't want Stony Brook to get too low, so we are able to shut this off so we can have access to the rice. And then we are able to open it up and let that flow out in the spring so that the lakes can flush and go through their natural cycle because that moving water is important to the manome and the rice for its growth. NRCS um, started this project with us in conjunction with the Fond du Lac Band probably close to 20 years ago was when we first started studying the hydrology of the area and um, trying to figure out how could we bring it back to its natural state. And then over the years we were able to utilize the EQIP program to uh, help us with some of these structures that you see here. It started out with the hydrologic study or model that the NRCS state office assisted the tribe with. And during that study, they determined how much flow and volumes were coming through these different lakes and what could we do to help manage that correctly. And that's what we came up with was we'd like to be able to stop the flow here at certain times of the year. And we'd like to be able to open it up wide open at certain times of the year. A lot of what NRCS was able to help us with was uh, technical assistance over the years by helping us figure out the hydrology of the area and also financially too with um, some of the programs that we were able to utilize such as EQIP. The dam that's it's an impoundment on the west side of this lake, it controls about a 25 square mile watershed, perches the headwater lake and that flows to Jass Carry. That one flows into Rice Portage. And then that water all comes down through Stony Brook and into this lake, Deadfish. There's also Miller Mud Lake, which is kind of its own little deal, but it eventually that water flows from there down into here too. So all those lakes together are a very significant part of the food source for the people here on the reservation. And prior to putting the impoundment in there, that watershed would flush into this lake and flood it out almost every couple years. And it was really um, difficult to almost impossible to consistently manage wild rice here. It was kind of an engineering feat, that one, because it was a structure that normally isn't built on organic materials like that one. And it took a lot of effort and a lot of um, technical expertise to figure out how to do that on that peat moss type soil that it had to be built on. And I was actually really proud to be part of NRCS that we could come up with a good plan like that. It's been amazing to help us manage the wild rice resource here. Without it, we would probably lose our rice here every few years. About six years ago, we had a 500 year flood here in, in northeastern Minnesota. This was engineered probably for like a 300 year flood. It toppled over the dam and it didn't cause any damage and it held up to that kind of a flood so I was pretty proud of that. And due to the ditching that occurred back in the turn of the century to drain some of this land around here for agriculture, it really was detrimental for our rice 
because it channelized all the flow of the water from a 25 mile watershed to the west and it would bounce into this lake. Whenever we'd get a big rainfall, it would come in here, down that ditch system and flood this lake out. It's degraded several wetlands that used to act like a sponge and they'd allow the water to absorb into the wetland and release over time. Where now you got the channelized flow that disrupts really the cycle of the Minoman. All the meanders were taken out and these ditches are very difficult to manage because of the beaver activity and it just doesn't flow like it used to. But to get these wetlands to function like they did one time is probably the biggest thing that we can do as humans to help enhance the Minoman here on the reservation. I don't know the exact acres and poundages, but I can tell you this, that it's fed a lot of Anishinaabeg people for millennia. These are an amazing resource here. It's the food that grows on the water. The reason our ancestors picked Leech Lake as our permanent homeland, as the reservation for us, is because of the bountiful resources here, including the rice. It's the reason we're here as a people. So, um, and, and my job is, is to protect and make sure that, you know, our kids can come out here and, and harvest rice the same way. For me, I like the, the sense of community you get from it. I have a lot of memories of coming out here with my family and harvesting when I was young. And, uh, and really, as my kids grow, I, I hope to share that with them. There's a, an island up the river here, probably three quarters of a mile. So we went up and went around that island just trying to find, you know, kind of the thicker, riper rice. And um, so it's more of a reconnaissance trip, I guess, you know, trying to see uh, how much rice is still out there, what, uh, you know, if we could find anything ripe to, to sit and pick, but um, we just didn't today. A lot of the rice was uh, knocked off from the storm that came through last night. so. A lot of it was empty out there, so we uh, went through and got what we could. And When you're ricing, it's really important to understand that you don't have to really hit it hard to get the rice to fall, you know, when, when the rice is ready to fall, it will just fall by itself. And it's the better rice anyways, it weighs more if you're going to sell it, it finishes up better when you cook it, and it's a better product on the back end. Plus you're not out there damaging the rice. The Leech Lake Band buys the green rice, gets it finished, and then commercially sells it, uh, hand harvested, you know, organic foods. And then we also provide it kind of for our people too, you know, different events, uh, donations, uh, on request. And, and really, uh, it's a, an area for food security for us as a people, so. NRCS's mission fits like a glove with a lot of times what the tribes want to do with protecting the resources, but also making the resources more productive. And so I think that, you know, we're a non-regulatory agency, but we're, we're there to help. We're there to help the people, help the land. And I think the more we can build relationships with tribes throughout the country, the better our landscape in this country will become. I can think of probably seven or eight tribes here in Minnesota that are have similar habitat to what we have here that probably have similar problems that could benefit from this type of technical assistance and possibly um, programmatic cost share that could help them out. I think it's a win-win for both the tribe and the, the government to government relationship with NRCS. I really feel that listening to the elders and taking advantage of that knowledge that they're willing to pass down to the next generation that traditional ecological knowledge that you can't learn in a textbook. The only way you can learn that is by interacting with the elders, by interacting with the natural world, learning it yourself. That is survival right there. If you learn how to survive, you will survive. <laughs>